My name is Mike Prather. I'm a, a fourth generation Californian. Um, my name, my, my dad's name, came into the state in um, uh, the mid 1850s. And um, but the, most of the rest of my family is also has, and they have long roots in the state. Um, I uh, grew up in Northern California, Tonoma County. Uh, very uh, attached to the ocean and the local environment. My family was a, a very outdoors type family. We did we, we hunted and fished and camped. And, uh, we had uh, a cabin, a small cabin at the coast, and a small cabin up on the Russian River. So I I grew up very much outdoors. Not necessarily that politically those people would have uh, blessed what I did with my adult life, although they do because they love me. Um, but uh, but it was but I think I was motivated by this environment that I came from. You know, when you're when you love something a lot, uh, and for me it was uh, things that are outside. Uh, then you come to their defense sometimes when when they're when they're threatened. And I just uh, I've been doing it for a long time, so. Uh, so I, I was a child of the 60s. Uh, the whole world turned upside down, basically, for a white guy from the suburbs in Santa Rosa. Uh, went away to school when everything was churning politically and philosophically and lifestyle-wise. Um, Earth Day in 1970, that's, that's the year, about the year I graduated, I think school and uh, was a biology major and I just where did you go to college I went to I went to uh, Santa Rosa Junior College for a couple of years that was my hometown and then I went to school at Chico State Cal State Chico and uh, so I'm from Sonoma County my wife's from uh, who shares all the, the things I just mentioned she's from Reading so she's also a Northern Cal person so we left, we left Chico, moved to Death Valley. We, we had teaching uh, certificates. We moved to Death Valley to teach in a two-room school um, in a place where there hardly is any water. Um, got to live with the Park Service for eight years, taught at uh, K through six. Uh, Nancy did kindergarten through third. I did fourth through, fifth, fourth through sixth. Drove the school bus, did the janitor stuff when needed. Um, what year did you move to? 1972. So we lived. So we lived with the Parkies, the Park Service, National Park Service, and um, got to teach uh, Native American kids. There was there was a, a fair number of them in uh, uh, in Death Valley at that time. Paiute Shoshone. Um, got to know a little bit about their culture. Didn't pry. Didn't enter. It's very private. Very private people. Even after eight years. Um, and. Time doesn't change the color of your skin or history. <laughs> so, so, uh, but it was a rich experience. And uh, so then we moved to Death Valley, or excuse me, to uh, Lone Pine in the Owens Valley in 1980. And so we've been living in in the Owens Valley um, for a long time, whatever that is, 30, 33 years. You mentioned the 1960s and the rise of an environmental movement, very common around Earth Day. Um, what do you recall being the most pressing issues about and the environment then? Well, I've always been, uh, uh, I, I think, you know, an environmentalist is, is a term that's so general, it's, it's just almost not useful any longer. I try to tell my opponents that sometimes, my friends that don't agree with me, and, and I'm not sure that they really accept it, but it's A to Z, you know. So I was mostly on. Uh, uh, I was mostly interested in uh, in wildlife, uh, parks and wilderness. The wilderness bill had passed. The, the original Wilderness Act passed in 1964, the year I graduated high school. Could you explain what that is? Well, it created these systems. Um, it, it, go, it was based on uh, Aldo Leopold and a whole host of other people. It took uh, eight years. It was first introduced in '56. And then eventually uh, passed Congress and was signed in uh, '64. And basically, it says that, uh, that we want places where there are few signs of, of man, humans, um, where they are, where there is natural quiet, 
and solitude and where people are only visitors. Um, and these areas would be designated by an act of Congress, not an administrative thing that uh, a superintendent or somewhere in office could just sign and then change. Somebody else could change it later. This was, this was law. So I've been working a lot on the wilderness. In fact, I'm going to D.C. next week to work on a, a new desert bill that's going to be introduced by Senator Feinstein later in the month, we hope. That's um, fantastic. Yeah, yeah. So I, uh, when I moved to the, to the Owens Valley, um, I had a chance to get around people that were more active, older people than me. I was in my 30s. And, um, and these were people that were Sierra Club people. Mostly, uh, Sierra Club has a, a long history of being a very well organized, very uh, effective uh, group that has evolved over time since Mears and others started it. And so I got around people that knew um, how to do uh, organizing, how to do uh, politicking, um, how to do communications, a lot of a lot of training with them as a, just as a volunteer, just as a member, an activist. And I, I kind of like the word participant, you know, because that's what Ben Franklin and everybody wanted originally. They wanted people to participate in America. That's what drove the French and the Europeans crazy. They couldn't understand these Americans. They have all these associations, all these clubs, you know, volunteer fire departments and all this and that. And it's, I think it's still the, the case. I think it's in us. It's just we, we participate, at least those that are awake. That are awake and motivated, they they participate. I think it's also like connected to a, a sense that we can change the future, where there's a sense of fatalism about how things are. I could, I don't even think I don't even give that a thought any longer. I might have when I was younger, maybe when I was a little more uh, uh, of an idealogue, idealistic. Um, as I as I've gotten older and as I've watched older people work. Um, with experience, I, I try to get situations and issues and people to places where we can get something done. I try not to be a fool. Uh, I, I try not to be too naive. I, I give young people a, a chance to be naive, but I expect them to write. Um, and they will, if they're awake. Um, and, and so I, I work on hard stuff. My county, Inyo, Inyo County is the county I live in. It's, it's a little bit larger than the state of Connecticut. It has 18,000 people. Um, if you like open, empty spaces, that's the kind of place that those kind of people go to. So our valley from Long Pine up to Bishop, which is our, our, our metropolis, our Paris of the Eastern Sierra out there, um, is full of uh, writers, uh, professional uh, photographers, uh, international climbers, and uh, and guides that do extreme, extreme outside things. Um, extreme runners, uh, people that do 50 to 100 mile races, um, and it's just it's just full of those people. So shortly after I moved there in in, in 1980, I got around a few people. Uh, not necessarily those extreme people, but they are always I like extremes are all word, but those amazing people, exceptional people. Um, but those those people have always supported uh, a lot of the stuff we've done. They've always supported us in their own way. They are not political, most of them. You know, they're business people, they're physicians, they're write, writers and photographers. But we formed a um, an Audubon chapter. We formed a uh, we formed a uh, Native Plant Society chapter all in the first uh, two or three years of, of the 80s that, that didn't exist. Uh, we kind of brought the Sierra Club a little bit out of the closet. There had been a group there that dispersed. It's a very hostile, politically conservative area for, uh, uh, it's changing, but uh, it is a difficult place. It's a Sarah Palin place. It's a, it's a Fox News place, and uh, but it's changing. In fact, we just we just had uh, we have four new supervisors that are that are um, give us hope. We have one of the originals who's she's a tough nut, really smart, hardworking. She's a friend of mine. Uh, we we agree on. 
around family and honesty and hard work and stuff like that. But she's a her family's been ranching and they own the valley since the 1870s. I mean, they they look, they look at the world in a different way, and, and I can't um, I can't I can't criticize that. You know, I mean, how can you how can you criticize that? So, but the newer ones are are much better. Actually, give a little bit of hope for Inyo County that uh, if we can hang on to these guys that are willing to listen to people that come to the Board of Supervisors meetings and not give them two-hour lectures, you know, uh, using lines from Sean Hannity and Greta von Sestern and, and all of this. It's just, it's just brutal to go through some of those, uh, uh, those sessions at times, especially for new people. It's just, they just walk out with their shoulders down. I'm used to it. But anyhow, so working the local politics is, uh, it's really important. It's easier where I live because there's fewer people. Mm -hmm. Individuals make more of a difference up there. Things are much more diluted here. I've been, I've, I've been in city council offices in Los Angeles. Um, I've, uh, I've met the mayor. Met, uh, I think he's still the mayor. Um, and uh, he's been to the Owens Valley a couple of times. And met with, often with the, the Water and Power Commission, the ones, the five that are, that are appointed by the mayor to oversee the Department of Water and Power. Um, they're political people. They're usually big time fundraiser and organizers. That's how you get those. There's 55 commissions in, in LA, in the city of Los Angeles. And you usually get those by, they're plumps. You get them by pay to play. Even if they're Democrats. There's no oh, oh, there's a difference. There's no difference. <laughs> the first Slimer I ever met was in 68. Uh, that was a horrifying. That was where I was naive, and it was a lesson. Would you tell us about that? Sure. Um, 1968, uh, friends of mine, we were at school at Chico, and we began organizing for Eugene McCarthy, who had challenged the President of the United States for uh, running for president. In the Democratic Party, he was a. Uh, a uh, I think Gene McCarthy was from Wisconsin. Um, he was a wonderful man, just a, a real intellectual, um, honest, kind of straight shooter, pure guy Perfect. that appealed to a lot of us. Um, and uh, if I remember right, because I'm getting old. I think we beat, or came very, very close to beating uh, the pre sitting president, Lyndon Johnson, in New Hampshire in the primary. And soon after that, I think, is when Johnson announced that he was, he was not going to seek another term. And that's when Bobby Kennedy jumped in. So a lot of our age group, our cohort, jumped on the Kennedy bandwagon. It's, 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 uh, it's got a lot of charm. It's pretty. Um, I stuck with McCarthy and pushed door bills. So we opened up an office in Chico on Main Street, next to the pizza parlor. And uh, we had a phone bank going, and in came this hired gun kind of person they hire. And they, when they organize, they hire all these political type people to organize in towns and neighborhoods and communities. And uh, a lot of these people are are pretty disgusting people, quite honestly. So this guy came in one night, so I was maybe uh, 21, something like that age. And he was an older guy, he came in just absolutely drunk. He had two uh, nice ladies, one on each arm. They were also three sheets to the wind. And he came in and started berating all of our local Democratic uh, uh, club people in Chico for not knowing what they're doing hicks and stuff and the students and all that kind of stuff. And uh, that made a big impression on me. Not that I was going to quit because the guy's a jerk. He's going to be gone. He's going to go out the door. Um, but those are the kind of the learning experiences that uh, watch uh, primary colors. Mm -hmm. um, that, has, uh, mm -hmm. that has little bits of that in it and some of the other really good political films. So anyhow, we lost.
could have gone to Chicago as a delegate that we lost in California. And that night, uh, Bobby Kennedy was killed. I was in San Francisco at our, at our party. And uh, we all saw that on uh, that night. It was a bad year, 1968. Would you tell them about Chicago 68? Well, I wasn't there. Um, but it was, uh, you know, there were a lot of activists that were uh, very militant activists, right up to uh, violence, you know, uh, weathermen and, and, uh, and others. And uh, they were well organized in uh, Chicago. And um, where the Democratic Convention was, the mayor was Mayor Daley, the father of the previous Mayor Daley, who was a real, um, real ball buster kind of Democrat machine kind of guy in Chicago. And uh, so the protesters organized out in a park across the street. Um, most of it was, pro it was probably peaceful. But there's often groups that will use that group to cause something to happen and to unwind. And so they're, they cause basically it to start breaking into violence and things. And then there was just what they called a police riot, where the police came in and, and just cleared that park with just, with just some billy clubs. And there was just, just blood and people in everywhere. Dan Rather was critical of it. He was a CBS reporter on the floor of the convention. And uh, he was challenging Mayor Daley's thugs, I think he called them out on the street. And uh, Daley had the security people grab Dan Rather, pick him up, and carry him off the convention floor, which was just amazing. Amazing. Anyhow, so, Rich, so we got Richard Nixon. <laughs> Stuart <laughs> <laughs> Humphrey and Richard Nixon. So, anyway. So it was That's a enough to make very it political, violent, mm -hmm. messy, mm -hmm. all yeah. these kinds of shows of force, mm -hmm. different groups within political groups mm -hmm. um, causing dissent, often police informants mm -hmm. were paid to do that. Um, so, watching that as a 21 year old, uh, you, did you, I mean, obviously you have this disgusting experience with someone in your own campaign offices. How did you react in terms of organizing? I know I, I no longer, I haven't since worked on any political candidate things other than locally, our supervisors um, in our county. Um, I work on wildlife and water and both so spaces, wilderness. Focusing on pe our animals over people too. Environments. Yeah. I work on environmental stuff. Trying to make a trying to save the best of what's left. I want to ask you, um, you describe yourself as an activist, an information junkie, an archivist. Um, would you elaborate on this? You know, I, in, in school, I mean, I was, I really liked, um, I really liked information and, and history and facts and that sort of thing. I was not very good in math. I did take a degree in biology, so I had to take some physics and chemistry and whatnot. I did okay. Um, but I've always liked to read and learn. And uh, the primary goal, I mean, I'm a, I'm a retired uh, teacher now, I've taught for 29 years. Um, I, I think the primary goal, really, uh, of, of teachers, for teachers, for students, is to turn out lifelong learners. Uh, you, you literally want these individuals to never stop learning until the day they die. And maybe they won't stop learning then, for all I know. So, um, it, Because that's just the way, that's the richest thing you can do you know, for, the, for humanity, you know, for the, the human flowering kind of thing. Um, so I... Uh, got uh, my degree in biology, I uh, got a high school credential, and then my wife Nancy was teaching elementary school, teaching kids how to read, and God, that was just fascinating, breaking down phonics and, and uh, using, you know, my teaching writing, and, 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 and so I kind of got interested in that, well, maybe I'll get an elementary credential, so I got one of those two. 
And that's how we ended up in Death Valley, which is a K6 situation. Um, uh, my archivist stuff is that I've, I've collected a lot of the stuff that I've done uh, actively for environmental stuff. I mean, I have um, notes from countless conference calls and phone calls, uh, um, workshop stuff, lobbying materials for uh, especially the desert bill in 1994, like California Desert Protection Act. Um, but also a lot dealing with uh, the water battle between Inyo County and the city of Los Angeles over Los Angeles. Um, mainly it's over their pumping of groundwater, their, their use of groundwater, which has been the modern water war uh, in Neon's Valley. No one with any sense of reality is trying to undo uh, what happened 100 years ago Los Angeles bought the Owens Valley, basically. They own 240,000 acres in our valley, and they own the water. No one's trying to undo that. And that's the first aqueduct, which was finished in 1913. Second aqueduct was finished in 1969. It was to be filled with groundwater. So Los Angeles came back. It's kind of like the Delta. Uh, Southern California is now back up there and has the governor convinced we need to put two giant tunnels under the, the delta, Sacramento, San Joaquin River Delta, to bring more water to the south. And somehow they will salvage and fix it and everything else. To me, what it looks like is Southern California coming back once again for the future of Northern California, which is the water. Um, you take away the water from a place and you take away a lot of their their future choices and uh, and dreams. So uh, Los Angeles came back in '69 with their second aqueduct, which is to be to take water out of the ground. Uh, first aqueduct was surface water, melting snow. Second aqueduct was out of the ground. And when they turned the pumps on in 1970, uh, they destroyed uh, numerous springs, the two largest spring systems in the Owens Valley. One at a place called Fish Springs, and at another place called Black Rock Spring. They also dried up lots of meadows, places that had water would come to the ground to support these large green areas. They call them spring fields, meadows. Uh, the water was pumped feet, yards below the root zone, and so the vegetation died. This happened before I was there. Uh, Inyo County uh, used a, a new law uh, that I don't think they even understood called CEQA, California Environmental Quality Act, and in 1972 sued the city of Los Angeles that the city had to do one of these things called a, an environmental impact report. But I don't know, they didn't really knew what the heck it was. And uh, that began litigation. I moved into town in 1980 was mentored by some water activists, old timers. People are all dead now. Uh, it, was, it was 30 years ago. They were they were 60 or better then. They were my age then. Um, and they're the ones that taught us the, the history. Uh, they, they were there and watched what, what happened. And so a few of us are still active. I was acting with the Owens Valley Committee for a long time, as president twice. Um, that group is still uh, organized. Um, and some of those people are ones from the go way back. So that's a good group to have contact with the Owens Valley Committee. OVCweb.org. What, what was the, did they do an environmental impact report then? They did. They did an environmental impact report that was Pretty thin. Uh, I like to say it was a little bit thicker than a Denny's uh, menu. And uh, the court, uh, they were challenged on it, and the court rejected it as being inadequate. So they did another one and came back in about three years with one that was three volumes or two volumes and inches thick. It was also challenged as being in inadequately describing the impacts and the foreseeable future and what had occurred in the past. And, uh, 
describing the, what the project itself was going to be, this groundwater plan. And so it was also thrown out by the court. And so what came next was NEO and LA began talking to each other. Maybe we can come to a settlement or an agreement and kind of design our own future and uh, not spend all this time in court. It costs a lot of money, it takes a lot of time, it's a lot of uncertainty involved with that. I'm going to get a drink of water. Oh, yeah. Cheers. Um, how do you challenge an environmental impact report? Do you have to hire someone as like the CR Club would garner funds to do that? Or is there money set aside by the state to help generate oh, there's, criticism? There's no, Yeah. I wouldn't say there's any money by the state. The state, you know, this is CEQA, the California Environmental Quality Act, is meant to have uh, transparency in these in projects. Um, it's meant to have information, a clear description of what this project's going to be, come out in the open, and then the public, and then agencies like Fish and Game, now it's Fish and Wildlife, um, and other agencies can comment on it. And uh, then their comments can be incorporated or they can be um, explained away and, and this whole thing can go forward. At that time, then you could go to court and challenge uh, the environmental impact report. But what you might get is a court saying, yes, it is inadequate, but the court's not going to tell you what it needs to be. Um, but sometimes it's still, it's much better than nothing, that's for sure. And it followed the national environment. Yeah, called NEPA, which uh, both are kind of under assault right now, especially here in California. Would you explain that? Well, the governor, uh, the governor had, a, um, and some of the legislators um, feel that CEQA is used to uh, block or delay and thereby increase the cost of projects, favorites, like a football stadium in Los Angeles. Uh, but it could be a housing development in a beautiful strawberry patch in Watsonville. I mean, it could be any environmental project, any, any kind of project. And he wanted to streamline it, you know, make it better uh, for who? <laughs> Developers, bankers, and people that donate to political causes. Um, so that's, that's taking place right now. There's a nice editorial in the LA Times this morning. Mm -hmm. Exactly on that. It's by John Vandekamp, who was a past Attorney General of California. He was a DA too, I think, here. Yeah, usually there's a path, you know, mm -hmm. you kind of go through. Um, and uh, I think he was from, from the mid 80s to early 90s or something. So he talks about the importance of that act and how uh, he argues against it being used to delay needlessly that there's, or frivolous lawsuits. And uh, it's, it's really quite well written, so you can get it online. So anyhow, um, as environmentalists, since we are, uh, we, we really don't have the means usually, we don't have the, the deep pockets, um, uh, we go to workshops and training by people that do EIRs, that train you as a, just a citizen. How would you look at this? You know, what does the law require? And um, it's not too tough. You know, you, yep. It's, it's a learning curve, but you, you can do it. Yeah. Um, you arrived in Lone Pine in 1980, mm -hmm. and the pumping aqueduct had been in effect 10 years. Did you see effects after that, from 1980 forward? Or were the effects just, the immediate effects happened within that first decade? With our county, I'm a, well, I'm on the Inyo, I didn't, one thing I didn't share is that I am on the Inyo County Water Commission, um, which is uh, a group of five people appointed by the Board of Supervisors to, to gather, um, to conduct meetings throughout the, the, the year and gather information or comments from the public on these water-related issues. Um, so I'm, I'm still in the middle of it, so to speak. Um, we're going to be down here the 20th, I think it is. We'll have what's called a standing committee meeting. It'll be at the top floor of the DWP building where the Water Commission meets. And that's where Inyo County and LA meet. 
regularly through the year to try to sort through things, difficulties. The agreement was signed in 1991, 1991, and there are numerous important aspects of it that um, are not working well. They're not working. Oh, damage since the pump. Because I came 10 years after right. the real bad stuff. Yeah, and the way the damage occurs nowadays is in the agreement, past water practices, you know, spreading water, a certain amount of greenery, certain, um, there's protocols for measuring meadows and irrigated pastures and things. Um, those practices are to continue. Well, there have been places where it hasn't, um, and there's been disagreement between Inyo County and, and Los Angeles. Um, one of the ones going uh, in dispute right now that'll be talked about the 20th um, deals with a place called Black Rock 94. And it is a vegetation monitoring site that is linked to a nearby groundwater pumping field, a well field, where these wells go down, um, you know, 300 feet, 500 feet, 700 feet. And this dispute is that there has been measurable change in this vegetation plot. There's places where um, the species uh, composition is changing, where it's going from meadow of grasses, which um, have shallower roots, to shrubs, which have deeper roots. They come in after the place starts to dry. They're kind of an indicator. And there's places where there's out and out death of vegetation. So Los Angeles is saying that it's, DWP is saying it's not their concern, not, not their concern, it's not their uh, fault. They, uh, they say that uh, Inyo hasn't demonstrated that the groundwater pumping is tied to these effects and that's being hammered out right now. It's been in dispute for at least a year. So it's kind of crazy go to a mediation um, as part of the process to try to solve it. Are there scientists on the other side? Yes. Or is it like um, the global warming debate that we're constantly dealing with in the public sphere? The water, water agreement, the water agreement is, um, the Inyo County Los Angeles water agreement um, has uh, funds that uh, Los Angeles gives to Inyo County with no strings. It started with a million dollars a year and with a COLA, cost of living adjustment, um, to fund Inyo County's water department, which would have scientists, hydrologists, plant people. Um, we do have legal counsel. Um, our, our water department has a permanent staff of nine. Nine. Department of uh, Water and Power has many more, and they have lots of money, and they hire out and bring in scientists um, that are consultants that can look at vegetation or look at hydrology and pumps, and uh, pay them great sums of money, hundreds of thousands of dollars, and kind of use that to argue their case against Inyo, which has nine, and limited amounts of money. For our county, not a very. It's also very. No important. counties are wealthy anymore. <laughs> maybe, maybe Marin. Yeah. <laughs> San Fernando Valley. Um, I think it's also really odd to have your money coming from them. It's kind of like tobacco money that they set aside to, with these promotional campaigns that are anti-tobacco. Mm -hmm. I mean, you say that it's no strings attached. Is that money guaranteed? How is it guaranteed? Well, the water agreement is like a, con a contract. A so contract. contractual law uh, would, would apply. Yeah. And the uh, dialogue between uh, Inyo County started it, uh, formally in LA in 1991? Um, the negotiations began probably in the early 80s. Okay. So that's when, after all of this, they started talking. Right. Um, Danielle and Los Angeles began talking about a water agreement. So a group I was 
of uh, an activist with uh, called the Owens Valley Committee at that time. Um, we met in somebody's home. We had have big bowls of popcorn and eat apples and uh, and try to you know go after Goliath. You know, so we were able to eventually get um, the legal counsel pro bono, but we we had to pay out of pocket like. Uh, mileage, meals, lodging, uh, costs of filing certain uh, briefs and things, but uh, the hours and things he, he ate. And, uh, and so that helped. Yeah, it's easy to do nothing, always, in anything. And it takes effort to do something. How would you define your first activist moment? Um, I remember as a young boy going with my dad, who was a, uh, a planning director for Sonoma County back in the 1960s. And he was approached by a group of men or people that were active with a sailing group. I was in a, a sailing group, it's the youth part, where we, we, we learned to sail and we raced and, and stuff. Um, and they wanted, they came to my father because they probably were using me as the foot in the door, I guess. It's okay. Um, they wanted him to go to a hearing uh, down in Marin County, which was not our county, uh, over the formation of, of the Point Reyes National Seashore. Um, they, because my dad was a planner for the adjacent county and uh, his voice would mean something. He was really a good speaker. He's very. Uh, it was easy for him to, to speak. Did seldom use any kind of notes at all, any kind of guidance. Um, and so I went with him and watched him. And I, maybe that, maybe that was that made me interested interested in those kinds of things. Little meetings. It was at a restaurant bar in Olima, I think, uh, yeah, near Point Reyes. The other question I wanted to ask you related to your teaching, um, what was your favorite teaching moment in Lone Pine as well as in Death Valley? Because I know they're two different groups of students. Well, I think Death Valley was the best. Um, Nancy and I are still in contact with students we had there uh, and some of the parents. Um, these students are now in their 40s and they have their own families. You know. Um, it was it was a it was a place where you could teach in a very in a very simple way. Um, our principal was 65 miles away, um, and I got most of the teachers had school bus drivers licenses because if um, somebody got sick or quit, uh, you had no more transportation unless you had somebody who could jump in the bus and drive the bus. And so uh, I had a school bus driver. I drove, I could drive buses all the way up to Crown size buses. So if you wanted a field trip, you didn't have to go through offices of administrators and deal with the costs. Uh, nowadays, people like, can't even have field trips unless you raise the money, and maybe not even. Mm -hmm. um, it's really sad. Uh, so we just jump on the bus and just go. So we had one outing a month during school days somewhere in the park. Yeah, parents were invited, neighbors were invited. It was very inclusive. Um, it was all instructional, you know, science and, and natural history and things. And then uh, we always had one Saturday per month, uh, a non-school day. And those were, that was the best. Yeah, that was, that was a great place to live and uh, to teach at that time. How hot did it get? And how cold did it get? We didn't even use a heater in our house. No, I mean, you know, it's a little bit like LA in a way, in some ways. Um, almost never froze. It might freeze. We lived up off the Death Valley floor above Furnace Creek Ranch. Down there, it's lower, like uh, 200 feet below sea level, where there's a golf course and things. They could get a little frost in there in the morning. Um, you turned on your swamp cooler in April. And it stayed on through October, pretty much. It's really hot. Do 
you guys know what swamp coolers are? Water yeah. 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 evaporative coolers. They, they trickle water through these pads uh, of fiber material, and a, and a fan blows that, that water, that air that's cooled by that evaporating water that blows that into your your home. Hmm. Works really good in dry climates. Um, and Lone Pine, I, I don't know. I, I, I can't. I don't know if I can think of any okay. real thing. I, I just I liked it all very much. I taught uh, I taught fifth grade and sometimes fourth and sixth if we had to lump a little bit. And then the last twelve years I did uh, middle school science, sixth grade, seventh grade, eighth grade, and I, I enjoyed that. That takes a lot of patience. I yeah. really handle those years as a person, much yeah. as a teacher. Well, that's because you kept changing every six to seven. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> that's what you're talking to. You're, and talk, you ever you're talking to Jennifer here, and, and, then, and then you you think everything's great, and you caught up with all her girlfriends, and, and what this, she's going to have for lunch or whatever, and then she turns around, and when she comes around the next time, it's like a new Jennifer. It's a different Jennifer, a very fragile, very vulnerable Jennifer. <laughs> My archivist stuff. Oh, okay. um, uh, when I say archivist, I mean I don't mean like a library like this and stuff. I do collect all the materials that work on campaigns and things, maps and such. Um, but I've been. Uh, do you all know what the Stockholm syndrome is? It had to do with captives, you know, people held hostage, and that if you're held long enough, you somehow, for some reason, begin to. Yeah. Sympathize with your captors? Well, I have that with the city of Los Angeles. Uh, I'm not foolishly sympathizing with Los Angeles, but I collect uh, things related to water history and aqueduct history in the Owens Valley, and, and some Owens Valley town stuff, too. It's not the only, but I read all the literature. Um, I, I read all the, I've read all the history. When I, I have a daughter that lives in Los Angeles. She's a costumer. And uh, she lives over uh, Melrose and Fairfax area over there, apartment. Come down and visit her all the time because what a great city. I mean, it's tremendous. And I think go to a baseball was... game and go see the Book of Mormon in the same day. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's nice. Great, great restaurants, people of all kinds of colors and languages and stuff. Um, and it's rich, really rich. So I like it. I love the history. I, like, I follow all the politics. Um, and uh, in all the literature, film. Uh, a resource you might be able to use is if you get Paramount's uh, latest release of Chinatown, mm. um, which was re-released five years ago or less. Yeah. Um, it had, the extras in there are interviews with a whole bunch of us locals. Oh, awesome. And so then um, Robert Town, who wrote the screenplay, got the Academy Award. Um, they brought him up, and I got to tour him around Owens Lake and took him to the Alabama gates that the people seized years ago and uh, worked. <coughs> and just to be around him was pretty cool. He's an L.A. boy. Um, it's pretty ancient now, older than me. Okay, I want to ask you why are birds important to you? Oh, why are birds important to me? Well, I grew up around birds. Uh, I grew up outside. I knew a lot of the names of birds. Not, not like a birder knowing the names of birds, but like aunts and uncles and people, grandma and grandpa teaching you. Grandpa would teach you that oh, we ate all of those, you know. Uncle Lloyd, who was an Italian heritage, he uh, he would eat blackbird pies and stuff. Mm -hmm. and, um, so I, I grew up learning birds and uh, the names. And uh, at, in college, I got I got around. Uh, I was in a class. I was taking an ornithology class, and I got around some real birders. First time I've ever been around birders that are chasers. A chaser is a birder that gets a call um, on Friday that uh, that there's this rare bird at the Salton Sea. They might skip their class that afternoon, jump in the car, and drive day and night 
from Northern California all the way down here to see this bird. That fascinated me. Um, but I was young at that. Some, you know, foolish, young uh, pony. Um, but it just intrigued me. And then the depth of their knowledge. Uh, and a lot of them were biology majors, life science majors. But some were like uh, artists. They were, their, their field books were filled with sketches and quick watercolor studies. Really neat stuff. Uh, or photographers. So I like the idea of learning those those names. It's one of the reasons why it was easy to move to Death Valley because it's, it's known for having lots of rare birds. During migration, these birds are just spent. They're lost. They're crossing uncountable miles of, of dry desert, and they see a golf course and Furnace Creek Ranch, and shoo, down they go. So Labor Day weekend and Memorial Day weekend, it's a great place to go to get rare eastern birds that are lost. They just don't know where they're going. So um, my main interest is, is uh, natural history, but, uh, but I probably have uh, an emphasis on birds and botany. So I took my degree. I, I got a master's in botany. Um, and they're just, they're just wonderful. They're just, they represent it. They just, to me, there's something that people have always loved. All, almost all people like to talk about birds. All, lots, almost everybody has bird feeders. Um, we celebrate a special day in, in November, just dedicated to a bird. Sure, you know Thanksgiving. <laughs> um, I grew up hunting a lot. Um, I, I, I shot a lot of pheasant and quail and ducks. I ate them. Um, I don't, not anymore, I'm tired of plucking things and cleaning things and don't have to buy a license and stuff. But um, they have song, they, they have beautiful colors, they have incredible behavior, uh, they migrate. And many of them like insects and other things, but birds are the most visible wildlife. They, you can read an environment if you know how to read the birds. Um, you can look at the health diversity, the, the overall health of a landscape or a location, um, if you know what birds are there. So I like the idea of trying to help in citizen science, a participant again. Mm -hmm. So I've been doing, um, I've been doing um, breeding bird surveys, BBSs, breeding bird surveys, for the Federal Fish and Wildlife Service, uh, FWS. Uh, since the 70s, and, uh, and those are where you drive. You drive, um, a, uh, I think it's a 25-mile 20, course on a road. It's vehicle-based. You drive every half mile, you stop for three minutes, and you count every bird you see or hear, because birding by ear is pretty important once you get into it, um, because you'll, you'll end up getting more birds with your ears than you with your eyes, especially if you're in the trees, which you really need it when you're in the woods. Um, and then you just drive another half mile, you do the same thing, do 50 stops. But I've done Christmas bird counts with Audubon, and then I do, uh, I started organizing, because I have a lot of data on Owens Lake before the giant dust control project from back in the 80s. The dust control project didn't really start until 01 when the water came on. Um, but we've been doing what's called our big day. Uh, we, it's, it's, it's like a dipstick. You're just checking the, the level. We, we, we put as many people as we can get out on Owens Lake, and in one day we try to count every bird that's there. We do it every April and every August. And uh, lately we've been partnering with the city of Los Angeles, Water Power, because they have biologists. And I, I know a bunch of them. I've worked with them for years. Um, and they, they go out and, and, and help, too. We just had our last one in April, the 23rd. And we had uh, 100 114,999 birds. Yeah, it prints out your list. There's the list. Yeah. It's very diverse, too. That, that is a tenth of a million birds in one day. Um, that almost like, which shows the importance. Now, when we went out in the 80s, before there was a dust project, because that count was mainly 
the dust control project in the city of Los Angeles. We went on the 80s when there was no dust control project, just small little postage stamp wetlands, seeps and springs and mud floods. We might get 1,400 birds, you know, maybe push 2,000. Um, and now almost 115,000 birds. Could you explain so, the dust control project? Okay. I'm seeing these guys get tired. Did you guys have lunch? And here's the deal, because um, I heard that Mark was... Um, um, you're studying, or some of your coursework is engineering? The engineering, yes. Okay. Um, because um, the world is not black and white. We know that. Mm -hmm. um, but there's lots of loud people. Loud people. Left and right. Um, that uh, they want you to, they want us to think it's black and white. Because that'll make us uh, afraid or angry. And maybe give them money, watch their television show, become a member of their organization. So we have to watch out for that. One of the black and white fears is that all corporations are bad. Um, capitalism is bad. Um, I, and I'm kind of a left of center person most of the time. Um, that uh, development or engineering uh, is just, just, just destructive. Well, um, I, I don't feel that's true myself, and I, I'm kind of glad that most people I think don't think it's true, but I always worry about younger people coming in, because I just hate seeing people get all crazy, because there's wing nets from either side of the center. I work with them all the time. I've lost lots of friends. And he leaned over to me one time when I was struggling at a meeting, and he said, a lot of people just like to fight. Some time. It might be time to do some of that, but it's really nice to get something done. Then move on to something else. But uh, at Owens Lake, there's an example of a giant engineering project to control a huge regional health hazard of PM10 dust. Uh, these are particles less than 10 microns. They're invisible. Uh, human hair is about 70 microns. Um, so these are invisible. They go to the deepest parts of our lungs. They've been blowing there for 80 years or so, since the lake dried up in the mid-20s. Because the first aqueduct in 1913, you see, it took all of the streams um, that would flow eventually into Owens Lake. So after 1913, Owens Lake was no longer getting its flow of water. And, and so it began to dry up. And by the 20s, it took about 10 years, I heard, um, it was gone. And it began to blow. It was, um, all kinds of different particles, many, many different kinds of salts, and then some metals. The, the metal of the highest uh, count is arsenic, but there's also nickel and cadmium. There's a lot of arsenic in uh, desert water and springs. Things. Um, so the Clean Air Act, uh, the federal one and the state one, uh, was, was, I shouldn't, shouldn't say used, but I guess it was. It was used to compel the city of Los Angeles to control this hazardous dust source that for decades had been out of control. I mean, this dust would blow. The immediate area was maybe 40 to 60,000 people if you include Ridgecrest, a community south of us in a different county. But it, it at times blew all the way to San Bernardino. It blew well north of uh, Bishop. So it was way more than just our county. And so Los Angeles agreed to, to uh, fix it. And they started in 19, or excuse me, in 2001. Um, water, uh, which was one of their tools, uh, came on and began to control dust. And we're talking about on square mile levels. Um, so they, they created many, many cells that they can flood, they can get wet with sprinklers. Um, I'm trying to find a map. Oops. This is Owens Lake right here. 
So it's 15 miles this way, 10 miles this way. Blue is water, green is vegetation. In some places they're using gravel. So they're, they're tools that they're allowed to use are managed vegetation, it has to be a native seed source uh, or plant source, um, gravel or water. Uh, and where are they getting the water? The water is coming straight out of the aqueduct. Mm -hmm. So in a sense, it's like um, revenge on William Wall. <laughs> Up here at the north end, there's a pipe that goes right into the side of the aqueduct. It's underground, so mm -hmm. you have to point it out to people. It's 60 inches in diameter. It's five feet in diameter. It's, that that carries a lot of water. So that water drops by gravity to the lake bed where they can move it around with pumps. There's another pipe down here at the south end, a little bit smaller, that does this part. This part here, the brine pool doesn't make dust, but this part up here is where the dust uh, came from. So all of these areas are have berms and they're called cells. And they receive um, water from, during the dust season, from October through July. And then they shut it down for a, a month or so uh, for maintenance. Um, and this is unbelievable engineering challenge out here. Um, chemically, the, the surface it, and under it is, is, uh, is very corrosive. Mm -hmm. So if you're having uh, gates and valves and pump impellers and things, um, they're, they're sterling steel, ster uh, stainless steel, mm -hmm. stainless steel, um, which is which is not cheap. The pipes are like a almost like a composite metal and some kind of material, but they will run a, a light current of of electricity through it to try to ward off the corrosiveness, mm -hmm. you know, the, the loss or gain of electrons, whatever calls, whatever causes rust. Um, they hired a, an engineering firm called CH2M Hill, which is one of the largest engineering companies on earth. They're multinational, like Bechtel and Albert and that. And they, um, Los Angeles hired them to do things like the designing this project, uh, administering the, the work, uh, developing all the, the plans, uh, and they paid CH2M Hill uh, $105 million. $105 million was, was the fee. Um, so the work has been going on since uh, 2001 or so, actually a little before, and now we're 2013. The, the city of Los Angeles has spent uh, 1.2 billion dollars. They have hired uh, close to 100 new positions of all kinds. Could be a person who just goes out and checks what the water level is and how the gates are doing, but it could be a computer operator, a programmer engineers, um, environmental compliance regulation type oversight people, all kinds of people. To me, those are kind of green jobs. Green jobs because they're, they're spinning off Clean Air Act, uh, doing something for public health. And, uh, and, they, and we know with water and power, they pay very well. They, they, pay, uh, they pay, God, 50% more per position than other positions in the city government for the same job, uh, plumber, electrician, whatnot. Um, Does this image correlate to this to the study? Yeah, this is what caused the. This is what this is why the project was done. Um, this is from a video camera. This is actually a dust cam that you can visit if you go to uh, uh, the Great Basin Air Pollution Site. It's GB. Great Basin Unified, APCD.org, G-B-U, APCD.org. They have live cameras of, of Owens Lake. Um, they also have a whole history of everything, design projects, everything. But 
this is where tons in, in like a half an hour or less, tons of particles could go up into the air, usually associated with some sort of a major low pressure system coming off the Gulf of Alaska, coming onshore on California. We're in the rain shadow where we live. We have the ridge of the Sierra there on the way to Mammoth where we live in the Lone Pine area and the lake area is 14,000 feet high. So we only get about four inches of rain. So when the big storms come in, California might get rain, but we'll get wind. We'll always get wind. Sometimes you might get rain, maybe a little bit of snow, but always the wind's going to blow two or three days, and it's gone. Um, and that's just kind of horrific to me. Uh, that's the Inyo Mountains over there. This is a, a part way up the, the side of the Sierra. This is just the very northern end of the lake. The lake is 110 square miles. Have they tracked any kind of diseases, how, you know, clusters um, on any kind that's of... That's been difficult. It's all anecdotal. Mm. You know, there hasn't been able... You really couldn't do a study there, I think, very well. I'm not a statistics person. Um, but the sample size would be very small. These are small communities. Mm -hmm. But we have um, anecdotal evidence from ER rooms, you know, emergency medicine rooms, um, urgent care type things. We have a local hospital in, in Lone Pine. And then in Ridgecrest, they have a full-blown hospital down where the uh, China Lake Naval Weapons Center is. And those physicians there talk about, during the major events, uh, people with respiratory challenges, you know, people with emphysema, um, elderly, people with breathing oxygen, um, asthmatics. What is becoming in? They'll be coming in. They'll be they'll begin uh, suffering from that. So that's that's the best knowledge we have. Um, there's people that are concerned about the arsenic and cancer incidents and stuff. Those are really those are really tough things to do. You read all the studies where they're trying to help communities out in the farming areas with all of these chemicals that are used on, on fields, mm -hmm. and it's just, uh, it's hard, because you're going to be challenged. Mm -hmm. Especially uh, people with deep pockets. Yeah, and judges don't necessarily like to do science. <laughs> they would rather see the parties settle. Mm -hmm. that's, that's what the judges want, and that's kind of what the attorneys would like. Mm -hmm. um, so... Um, I'm going to ask you yes. to describe some of the photos that you sent sure. us. Um, I'm going to just begin with this one. Oh, this is a reflection um, of Bowens Lake in the foreground. And the sky and the mountains here in the background are the Inyo Mountains, just opposite the lake and the sky. This is a reflection. This was taken across one of the dust control ponds. It is an incredibly photogenic place. Los Angeles. Water and Power doesn't really want ponds out there because they're only required to keep a flooded area 75% uh, puddled or moist, and that will meet that will meet the air standard. The science, the science has been done, um, and that will meet the particles per cubic meter uh, that the law requires. And uh, so some of these ponds are like two feet deep and uh, or a foot deep, and they really only need to be much less. So they're, they're, they're adapting. They're starting to adapt. Um, but of course, this is what the birds like. Mm -hmm. But to me, this is a historical photograph also, in a sense. It's what the lake probably looked like before it disappeared. The first one was the 100th anniversary? Yeah. The, the, our local museum, our local museum in Independence, which is our county seat, um, has the Eastern California Museum, really a neat little museum. It has a lot of great stuff in it. And they had, um, in partner, partnering with uh, City of Los Angeles, had a 100th uh, year, uh, we didn't want to call it a celebration, because there's a lot of people that don't think it was something to celebrate about. Like these Paiutes, Paiute Indians that demonstrated out in front and inside uh, during uh, the general manager's talk, uh, Ron Nichols, the Department of Water and Power. But they were not, they didn't interrupt. Um, but they had some amazing signs. Um, this at the top is a photograph of uh, the aqueduct, some historical photograph. It's being presented to the, the manager or the director of the museum, uh, 
uh, John Klusmeyer by the Los Angeles party over here. This is the very, very um, <coughs> jovial, effervescence, um, greatest backslapping politician, very nice fellow, Tom, Tom uh, LaVange. Um, I've been lavange Yeah. It's a verb here. <laughs> <laughs> Loves to have pictures taken. He does. Um, Anyhow, so we have Inyo, we have, we have Inyo County uh, uh, over here, one of our supervisors. God, all the rest of these are all LA. Wow, we're really outnumbered. Um, so we have the general manager of the Department of Water and Power, Ron Nichols, uh, is a manager in charge of all water operations, Jim McDaniels, um, the councilman, of course. Uh, two water commissioners, Christina Noonan, Jonathan Parfrey, who is a green person, very green person here in Los Angeles. <coughs> he was with, uh, I think, was kind of one of the concerned sci scientist groups or physicians groups, and then is now, or had been with uh, um, the LA Green Coalition, I think. And then a couple more DWP higher-ups. But the signs by the Paiutes were really nice. This is what you're celebrating, and it's a photograph, a photograph of Bowen's Lake Dry. <coughs> Where's your conscience and things? There's a nationwide um, uh, Native American uh, protest of all things that are harmful going on, e and up into Canada too. Mm -hmm. uh, I forgot what it said, no longer silent or <coughs> no longer something. And, yeah, uh, I've heard about it, how they're using canoes to travel from Polynesian indigenous people have canoed all the way to continent here and then gone up to Seattle. And on the way, they meet Native American tribalists and talk and share stories as well as values about the general goal. In our valley, in our, in our valley, the Owens Valley, um, uh, when the settlers came in the 1850s, late 1850s, um, there began to be problems with uh, the Paiute folks. Um, usually in, involves something like somebody had a cow disappear, or uh, because you know it's easier to hunt a cow than a deer. You know, <laughs> it's very watchful when you think about it. Um, and uh, and where the farmers and settlers were is usually where there was water to spread. I mean, we do live in a desert, but there are these streams that come from the snow in different locations along the valley. Well, that's where the Indian folks, the Paiutes, lived too. So there began to be problems and violence. There were some massacres at Owens Lake, where they drove the Indians into the, they'd raid a village and drive the Indians into the lake and uh, just kill them all. Uh, one of those sites was just rediscovered last year during the dust project, where they were out doing some initial archeological work and they began to found, find these uh, artifacts and things and started finding um, Musket balls, uh, military ones, like soldiers. Uh, there's never been an admission that the military was involved. But things can, there can be renegade people anywhere. And so those, uh, the whole Owens Lake and the whole valley is, is an archaeological site. So yeah. It's amazing. Um, so the government sent a, a cavalry group up into the Owens Valley to. Uh, Supposedly, deal with some Indians that had been stealing horses down around the missions, and it turned out they weren't the ones that were stealing, and they seemed pretty peaceful folks. All the write-up was really quite, um, quite good, and uh, they were concerned about the Indian safety, the Paiutes. But they gathered them all up and they marched them from the Owens Valley all the way down to Fort Tahoe, which is on the grapevine five going over the top to Bakersfield. And there's a state park up there called Fort Tom. And there on a smaller spot down on the San Joaquin side, Sebastian, they, are, they had reservations and they held the Paiute people, the Owens Valley people there for several years. And then uh, I think they just allowed them to go back and walk back or whatever. So when they got back in the late 1860s, um, all of the places were taken, all the places with water, all the places where they gathered food, all the places where they moved seasonally, because these were 
These were people who moved seasonally. They, they, they lived very, very well for Great Basin um, uh, Paiutes. Um, they were beyond subsistence. They, 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 they ate well, but they lost all their land. They were completely landless until the mid-1930s. Um, they, they were squatters around ranches. They built a traditional uh, tule mat little houses, uh, wore things out of brush in the summer, just pile up brush and make it go over the top and have it empty in the middle and, and a door and, and you can get in there. Um, and they worked on ranches and farms and lived around towns. And then in the 1930s, um, Los Angeles got together, maybe at the invitation of the, the Bureau of Indian Affairs, the federal agency that deals, still deals today with those issues. Uh, to try to see if they could get some land for these people. And so they set up uh, rectangular reservations, small ones, in Lone Pine, Big Pine, and Bishop, and gave them an X amount of water that would flow in there. I think they gave them five feet of water for every acre of ground they had. And so that's where they've been living since. So that's a whole other story. And. Uh, the current president of uh, the Owens Valley Committee, Alan Baycock, spelled B-A-C-O-C-H. Um, Alan is um, is a local Paiute member of the, the Big Pine uh, Band and really knows the history well through his family and through his own study. <laughs> Would you tell them about the orchestra that you're in? Yeah, sometimes, um, you know, I'm, I'm a very linear person. I'm pretty, I kind of see things that, you know, we do this, and then you do that, and you do that, you know. And then there's people that are creative and can look at lots of solutions and lots of little tweaks and tweaks. And then there's artists. So sometimes it's artists that can get you to places, get people and societies to places where they hadn't been thinking or looking or seeing or hearing or feeling. So there's this artist named Lauren Baum, who is uh, uh, has a, has her own studio and her own stable of other artists and creative people around her. She calls it the Metabolic Studio, and uh, she does kind of projects like that. So she's been she's she got up to the Owens Valley. She's fascinated. She's an LA girl. She's fascinated uh, by this hundredth. Uh, year of the aqueduct this year in November. It's going to be 100 years. The first aqueduct was finished. And uh, so she began doing projects, uh, different art projects. She began trying to help local people grow food so we could have more local food and more choice and maybe healthier food and things like that. And that's been ongoing. She did a, she's a very hands-on philanthropic person. She likes to be right on the ground. With what's, with what's going on, because a lot of them are in buildings, you know, and skyscrapers and stuff. I don't see Eli Broad doing that, but <laughs> not to judge him at all, but, I, but anyway. Um, one of the things that uh, Lauren did is she uh, she rented this old uh, chemical plant, not the nasty kind of chemicals you think about with Louisiana and Texas and stuff, and maybe Wilmington or whatever's down there. Um, With fire plumes. <laughs> yeah. um, but one that just uh, made this uh, material called uh, called soda ash from the brines in the lake. It's a fairly benign product. It's not an awful thing. Anyhow, they had this large factory there, all these metal buildings and things. And it closed in 1970. So Lauren's group um, got a hold of the owner and leased this property. And they cleaned up the whole inside. They put a yurt inside so there could be meetings and functions even through the winter time. And her first her first project was to do. Uh, uh, she wanted she has this she has this uh, thread of a story called Silver and Water, which deals with water going from the Owens Valley to Los Angeles, building this big city, um, and the yellow brick road. Who knows what that is? And then there was a, we had a large silver mine called Saragora, um, a 
above, right above Owens Lake, uh, that back in the 1870s brought a lot of wealth into Los Angeles in terms of banking and investment and development. You know, kind of, I think it's called, they, they capitalized the city. You know, it gave it the wealth to then begin to, to grow. So that's the, that's the, the silver and water story. So one of the, one of the aspects of this story is uh, uh, she wanted to do uh, somewhere over the rainbow, but she wanted to use. She's fascinated by glass. She kept thinking of all the chemicals in the lake and things that are used in glass making. And if we can't, first she wanted to make the glasses themselves. Well, that didn't work out. So um, they went to the secondhand stores and just got stemware, you know. And then she hired a professional guy that does that kind of music. He does this resonance stuff, and way beyond that, um, Greg. And he, so he became the conductor for local people that were invited to do a whole bunch of rehearsals, and then a performance in one of the silos, big, tall, round silos, that was part of the plan. They cleaned it all out inside, it's all round. The audience was around the outside. Maestro was around the outside also. And in the middle were these tables with the glasses, and we played uh, somewhere over the rainbow. Lauren uh, is she's recording all of the stuff she's done, and she's done things down here too in LA. Her studio is just um, north of uh, of uh, near the, Chinatown. It's near the Spring Street Bridge, next to yeah, the state it's Park. literally next to the Spring Street Bridge, and. Um, and they did, a, they did, years ago, they did something called Not a Cornfield, where they built this giant cornfield out in an area that historically, apparently way back, had been a, a farming kind of area. Uh, when but they found it, I think it was a train yard or something. Yeah, it's switching yards. when uh, Crespi and Portola came mm -hmm. up for the Sacred Expedition in 1769, they talked about corn okay. growing along there. Okay. Um, and that it was a railway yard, and she spent millions of dollars cleaning it up so it could be a state park. The state took it over. There's a little piece of the Zana Madre in there, mm -hmm. the mother ditch, that came off of the river with this big, giant wheel that would pick up the water and then lift it to a higher level and dump it and then run the ditch. I think Lauren, didn't she? I heard that this? she's bending the river to, to a water okay. wheel. I was told okay. that six months ago. Okay, she had this project of building that wheel again and using it in the, the, narrow, the Narrows area or somewhere. Um, anyhow, it's just it's just it's just wild thinking that uh, that I can't even follow because sometimes I pick up the phone and um, and everything had completely changed. I, I did a little bit of work for her, a little bit of writing for her, and some research. And, uh, and participated in things and uh, got to know the group. Like I said, she, she grew up in Los Angeles, so she has a connection with Eastern Sierra, the Owens Valley, because that's the backyard of LA where people go fish and camp and backpack and ski at Mammoth. And uh, so she, she's, always, she's always done that, she's had a real interest. She's been able to get access to some of the real high levels uh, in the city um, and she's very into sustainable communities, you know, communities being able to uh, live within their means in, in, in terms of resources. So she's uh, tried to develop those sort of things. Um, what is it like participating in that orchestra as a non-artist? It was nice. I went, uh, Nancy and I both went. Um, if our daughter lives here in LA, was visiting, she would go to the rehearsals even though she, she couldn't make the performance. Um, it was uh, it was a small town we lived in, so you were seeing people that you know, people that were former students or whatever. So I, I like that aspect, and it was it was enriching to be around people that just do art, that do projects, that do thinking, uh, all kinds of different levels. Yeah. It's very yeah. it's an inspiring space yeah, that, to be in. And, and that, a lot of that kind of thinking had to do with a lot of the engineering of it was like, there was no book. There was no book on a shelf to take off about how to 
get giant vehicles and dig ditches and put in plumbing and get water to spread out and do all of this um, uh, at a place, an environment like Lost Lake. So it took uh, a tremendous amount of really engineering, creativity, a lot of r real creative creativity. And it was done for the public good. You know, and on multiple levels. I mean, first of all, of course, the health. Um, but the second, the wildlife the connection later, because the, the birds just showed up. I mean, just, they had been flying over since the lake had disappeared in the 20s. But um, immediately when the water was out there, the algae began to grow, these primitive algae mats, right on the mud, brine flies came in like a Mono Lake on the shore and began to breed in the algae and then that set the table for the birds because that's what they, they love to eat. Just train loads of, of, uh, of brine flies out there. They're really nice flies. They didn't ever land on you. If you're having a picnic or anything like that. <laughs> they, never, they, they don't ever land on you. It's wonderful to be around. So, and that's all engineering. And now, you throw in biologists and you throw in uh, computer programmers, you throw in remote sensing, different wavelengths to look at moisture in the soil from Landsat satellites or uh, plant growth. Um, it's, it's a marvel. Um, but anyhow, Lipkus and, and the tree people are amazing and they've done some interesting partnerships on that involve engineering. Um, they, they worked with different flood control groups and communities and entities in a place in the valley, um, San Fernando Valley called it Elmer, Elmer Street or something. Um, it's an area that always flooded when it rained. And the reason it flooded is, um, or it was kind of like one of the last places to flood, is it was a neighborhood and community that really didn't have a voice. I mean, they, that's just where the water ended up. That's the way it's going to go. So the original project was this big, expensive something. And instead of doing that, Lipkus got, got together with the flood control for LA County and the different cities and whatnot. And they designed a whole thing. They looked at a, they looked at a watershed, not being a mountain of trees or a canyon, um, but a neighborhood. They called it a, an urban watershed. And so they, they got buy-in from anybody that wanted to get in. And um, they went in and took out uh, driveways and made it uh, a permeable material where water could go through. They did uh, uh, rain barrels for, to collect water off of roofs. They did these uh, vegetated soft swales, they call them, um, that uh, that gutters direct water into these vegetated uh, and, and, and kind of hardened areas where we can get natural uh, infiltration back into the groundwater. And then there was a park nearby that had some kind of open ground where they went in there and put in a large catchment area for, for all the extra water. And I, I just thought that was a, an amazingly creative thing. I mean, it was millions of dollars mm. that was set to do this other project that was traditional. But Lipkus and his group convinced all these people to stay in the room, <laughs> federal, state, county, city. And that's what Audubon, when I do a lot of my work with Audubon and Owens Lake, is just to try to get people to stay in the room mm. um, and talk to each other, not uh, knock each other, fight all the time. That, that was a very inspirational story, I thought. And that would probably be on the Tree People website. Mm -hmm. Nice clips there. Um, I'm going to ask the students mm. to ask. They need to ask. Did you guys can, I, can, I, can I chew on a sandwich while we're. Oh, can you hear me? Well, I was it's actually. Fairly gonna, informal. Oh. Anybody I was going to actually ask you about the birds, but you, you answered my question, like about how the algae was growing and then they were migrating over and they stopped and that's why the numbers went up? These are pretty pr primitive algae. They're, they're not uh, filiform and, and, and things. They're more of just a, a, just a mat form. They're not really 
that attractive that's kind of, that's kind of dark and black. Or enough to stimulate. Yeah, it provides the food because yeah. they're the primary fixers, you know, the sun, it's energy, and then whatever nutrients might be in the, in the mud. And then the flies come in and breed, lay their eggs, the larvae feed on the algae. So. Have you, so besides the bird population increase, have you seen any other changes since they finished the engineering oh. project? Um, the the, the um, dust project currently is not finished. Oh, okay. Um, it is 90% compliant with the Clean Air Act, which is huge. Because I lived there when there was no control. And three or four times a winter, that whole Owens Valley, almost to the top of the mountains, would just fill with dust really bad. Uh, would you guys just have to stay indoors in those days? Or? I was at a high school basketball game one night, and it came. It, just, it gets in everywhere. It's so small, so you can taste it, you know, in your throat and in your nose, because the salt's dissolving. And there's no way. It's and it's yucky. so small that it like you put the bandana over your face. You'd have to have a. Uh, when I did, I did some field work before the project. I did some bird survey work as a. I was hired by a consultant that wanted to mainly find where snowy plovers were. That was the sensitive species that it was like. And um, so we were out um, on the lake walking on foot, often well away from your vehicles. So they gave us, we already had radios, and uh, I don't know if we had cell phones then. Well, we had radios. But we had breathing masks in case we got caught. Because the lake can go up really fast. It's like amazing. the... You know, the kind of the yeah. bug, like a bug, you know? Or yeah. Yeah, wow. that, that can really catch the small stuff. Good. Where again was the urban watershed? Pardon? Where again? What city? Um, San Fernando Valley on Elmer Street. Oh. Yeah. I want to say Sunland again, but... Sunland? I'm kind of guessing, but I think we can track it down oh, okay. on... Um, Tpeople.org. So Lipkus is a guy. Um, the Heel of Bay people, that group, I find um, remarkable. And um, Mark Gold was there, was their uh, director. He's now at UCLA. I think he's, just, he's an instructor okay. in some environmental department there. I think his name's Mark. His brother's oh, Jonathan Gold that does the food stuff for the LA Times. Mm. Jonathan Gold, is that the same? One that does the, I'm getting confused, Omni, is, that, is that the Omnivore Dilemma guy, or is that? No, that's different? Michael Pollan, I think. Okay, never mind, yeah. totally different. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, sorry, what was the name of the UCLA professor you just said? I think his name is Mark Gold. Mark Gold. He was a okay. former director of Heal the Bay. Uh, Santa Monica Mountains Group, Edmondson. He's probably not maybe day-to-day -day anymore. But that was an incredible group to take this land that people would love to put gazillion dollar mansions on. Sure. Yeah. But our walkable, wonderful open space and to try to go in there and save as much as you can, I, I just found that just remarkable. And Mono Lake Committee, another group that I that I really uh, find uh, I have a lot of admiration for. We don't have that level. I don't know why. So do you find um, many engineers have compassion or want to preserve the environment, or was the revitalization of the wildlife in the Owens Lake uh, just a byproduct of well, complying with the dust control? It was a dust project. Yeah. And in the early years, because I, I kept bringing up birds, and I would share data from surveys that we did with groups, and they would say, well, Mike, you know, it's, it's a dust project. Say, yeah, but the, the, you know, these birds are there. You cannot ignore them. You can't ignore them. But it was a, it, they just happened to show up. But now the conversation is the DWP wants to create this master project. It's guided by work we've done, a group of us have done with the DWP and a lot of stakeholders on an almost like master plan. Um, Owen Water Power wants to do a master project that would fix the dust 
save maybe half, as much as half the water they're using on the lake, which is an enormous amount of water they're using. I'll give, I'll give them that. It's 95,000 acre feet per year, which is a lot. Um, and would also protect the existing wildlife. It would enhance the habitat and protect it over time. And this is what this pretty thing is. So they spent probably several million dollars hiring a landscape architect firm to develop um, these different, what the land cover is going to be, different kinds, different color analysis, um, how they'll phase it in, and uh, different species that they'll work on, different birds that will benefit. Some birds are shore birds in the mud. Some birds are diving birds. We call these gills. They're, they're like groups of birds that have common kind of behavior, a way of making a living. So, um, so we have waterfowl, snowy plover, shore birds, migrating birds, breeding birds, and, uh, and that's what this is all. What this is all about. Um, there's a lot more to that story, but I don't know if I can. Get, I don't think I can get into it okay. today. Why don't we? Um... I'll just I'll just share something um, real quick. I'll try to be quick. Um, in, in 2007, um, uh, I put together a field trip uh, and, and invited uh, every individual and group I could think of that had an interest in Owens Lake. So that was who owns it, which is the State Lands Commission, who manages the wildlife. That's the Department of Fish and Wildlife. Formerly Department of Fish and Game. Um, the Dust Control uh, Agency, the APCD. Um, City of Los Angeles. Uh, ranchers, miners, wildlife people. Um, community people like the Chamber, of the Chamber of Commerce. And we did a, a lot of field trip there for a, for a day and a half. And, uh, <coughs> and the attendance was, I was really impressed. There were significant people, particularly from Los Angeles and state that came. Um, because you can always ask, but you don't necessarily get people to show up, particularly in really obscure, hard to get to places. Yeah. It's just, I mean, we're not on the road to, we're, we're not really on the road to anywhere. Where have you been? Um, and from that, uh, our Audubon group, um, our chapter got together with Audubon California, which is Audubon on a paid professional level. It's called Audubon, California, and they they agreed to uh, give us staff time to help us organize. And so we began a process to create a master plan for Owens Lake that would look at everything. It would look at water, look at birds, habitat, dust, of course. Um, somebody that wants to graze a cow, there's a little bit of mining, and look at all that. And after a couple of years, uh, Water and Power, DWP um, decided this is a great idea. So we're going to get we're going to hire a facilitator, which they did. Really good facilitator. Um, probably spent a ton of money just on that. And we did close to three years of meetings and field trips and work groups dealing with water, with habitat, with crafting the enforcement language of this master plan. Not master project, but master plan. And then last year, the Air Pollution District uh, up our way um, issued an order to Los Angeles that they had to do, DWP had to do 2.9 more square miles of dust area. That they were about 90% finished, but this is, they needed to do this much more. And, and DWP and Los Angeles, they just, they just flipped. They, I mean, they were, they just dug in and, and refused the order. Um, and, and, and they appealed it to the Air Resources Board for California and Sacramento. They lost their appeal there. They appealed, uh, they had a federal case where they sued the Bureau of Land Management, they sued the, which is federal, they sued the State Lands Commission. They sued, um, uh, did I say the Air Pollution Board? Air, um, they sued pretty much anybody standing in the room almost that had some kind of authority. Um, and 
and they just they just had their federal case dismissed in a court in Bakersfield. And now they're just remaining in a state court where they're, they're saying that they're basically being abused. They're rate payers. Uh, their, their water rights are being attacked by these, uh, they called them rogue regulators. It's, it's a friend of mine, Bishop named Ted, very nice guy. But he will enforce the law. Um, so that case is still outstanding. But the problem was that occurred amongst our stakeholders. The DWP was a stakeholder. The State Lands Commission was a stakeholder. And, and so the DWP uh, has sued these others. So to keep those people in the room still talking about a master plan has been really tough. And uh, so we haven't had a meeting in a while. We're supposed to have one the 15th next week. And in the meantime, DWP came out with this, which has everything we talked about in the master plan, and they call it a master project, which will kind of do the same thing, but they'll be totally in charge. And so that's making everybody um, nervous. Yeah.